So I'm going to move into talking about safety in facilities. Um, in this lesson, we're going to talk about how to stay safe when you're entering prisons or other facilities where offenders are incarcerated. So to a lesser degree, jails, only because I have more experience in prisons. So most of my examples will be about prisons. I have also worked in jails. A uh, pretty similar environment, except for the fact that your population in a prison is going to be there longer term. And so some of their behaviors are going to be a little more predictable. So physical safety, when I'm going into prison, I really want to be thinking about where am I versus everyone else. So if I'm standing in the middle of a yard in a facility that has 3,000 inmates and there are no staff around, is there a reason for that? Is everybody perhaps in one area? Should I not be where I am? Really paying attention, if suddenly people run away from the area you're in, is there a reason for that? What should you do about that? Um, making sure that you aren't surrounded by inmates at any given time. So if you're walking through a gated area, I want to make sure that my back isn't to a large group of inmates. And you're going to enter areas within prisons where there might be one gate in front of you and one gate behind you. So do you have, do you have the situational awareness to know that you should be going through that second gate before you let the offenders in the first gate, and the officers will know that. Uh, however, it could happen. So then just making sure that you don't have your back to a large group or that you're getting locked in a hallway somewhere with a large group of offenders or even just a couple of offenders and just really paying attention to where are the staff, what is my situation here, and then what is my route out? So if I'm talking to somebody, I've been put in an interview room, and my gut is telling me that this is just not a good situation or I'm not comfortable for whatever reason. Maybe it's my first time in prison, but maybe it's my 300th time in prison, and I'm just not feeling safe. Say something about that. That certainly isn't something that you would be judged for, that you're saying, I don't feel safe in this room. I want an officer standing at the door looking through the door maybe, that you can have that sight versus sound, that they don't necessarily need to hear what you're talking about, or uh, you're in a situation where the person is restrained, um, and that, for whatever reason, is making you feel uneasy, and so just asking somebody to stand by. There's certainly never a time that I would encourage you to ask for restraints to be removed if they're there, they're present for a reason, and so being aware of that and knowing that that truly is for the safety and security of both staff and you and the offender in a lot of cases. Um, are there obstacles to your exit from an area? So often in prisons you're going to hear access and egress points of any particular building or room are there obstacles in your way of exiting that room? And so sometimes it's going to be in the way that you set up a room that the inmate themselves would be your obstacle. So are you putting yourself in that situation that you can't get out? And then contraband. So it's a word that you're going to hear a lot from prison staff. You're going to hear it a lot from me. Um, but do you know what it is? And why are we so darn worried about things that seem really innocent. So think about your cell phone, maybe take it out, look at it right now, and think about that being one of our most serious types of contraband, and that there is a great fear around your cell phone. And so you probably at this point you're looking at your cell phone like this lady is really dumb, and I have no idea why she thinks this could hurt people, um, because it probably wouldn't hurt very bad if I threw it at you. But so here's the deal. If we're talking about cell phones, there is a, a, there's a level of monitoring that occurs in a prison. And so if we think back to talking about uh, STGs earlier and how do they get drugs into a prison. So some of that has to occur through unmonitored contact, contact with the outside world or to hurt a staff member. I'm going to have to maybe get a hold of my friend on the streets, and I don't want to do that on a recorded line. So I'm going to try to do it during an unmonitored call. Well, one of the best ways to do that is on a cell phone that I got through whatever means, whether that is compromising a staff or whatever else, that suddenly I have this cell phone. And so that kind of unmonitored use is the reason that you'll hear so much pushback 
around both cell phones and technology as a whole. So often in dealing, you know, we're in Washington State and um, I deal with programs a lot. And so the pushback for me is, like, why are you so scared of technology as an agency? And certainly it does seem that way, that we have this aversion to technology, that we don't want them on the Internet and that we don't want the dead cell phones. And there are historical reasons for that. So the Internet would be not looking at victim information, not having that ability to contact. And, again, if we go back to the cell phone, now they have a cell phone. They have the ability, perhaps, to contact their victim and continue harassment or other things. So that's really why we're going to say, like, make sure your cell phone is locked up and you will be treated like a criminal if you try to bring a cell phone in because that's not – that is something that you would – perhaps have at the hospital, although I would discourage it because it has personal information often on it, um, but not something that you would have in the prison. So, and then just your own protection. So do you feel safest asking for a radio when you go to the facility? You can certainly ask for those things. Uh, there are other things, the other, other tools that you can ask to use while you're in a prison. And one of those is staff, that you would ask to have a staff member present or standing close enough by that you felt safe. You're going to be under escort at all times. Um, and so as you walk through the facility, but perhaps in your interview room, you're not going to have that person as close. So if you need them to be a little closer, just asking for that. Um, so much of prison life has to do with routine and process, and so I would ask in your coming into prisons that you really focus on your own routine and process. So some of the strategies that are going to help you in staying safe, understand the facility layout as well as the access and egress points of all the buildings that you go into. So per fire code, there are little maps that are framed. In almost every facility, I would guess every facility, but I can't say that with absolute certainty because it's been a while since I've been in every facility. But look for them. They would have your fire access on them. There's going to be some document that's going to tell you how to get out of that building. Not a bad thing to stop and look at. Understanding the Department of Corrections procedures. So in all of your free time, taking the time to read our 9,000 policies. I'm kidding. Um, but really... Understanding, why do we do things that we do? Why are we looking through your bag at public access? Why are we asking you to stop so that that can be searched? Why are we asking you to lock up your cell phone? Probably now, versus five minutes ago, the cell phone conversation has a little bit more that you have some understanding of why I'm so worried about that, which makes it a little less trivial. Um, feeling free to ask questions. So you can ask as many questions as you want. You have a site. A site contact as well as with staff as well as other people that you'll deal with at the Department of Corrections. Maybe that's the escorting officer that you're going to ask those questions to. The caveat to that, please don't do this during an emergency or in front of an offender. So for very much the same way that you wouldn't want to be questioned about your line of work or have your credibility questioned in front of a third party, our staff are not going to want that to happen. So really paying attention to their emotional state as well and saying, hey, they have to live, they have to work here every day and have this credibility, and I diminish that credibility if I'm asking questions about procedures. Um, in an emergency situation, always follow the clear verbal directives that are given by staff. Sometimes these feel very abrupt to folks who are not with the Department of Corrections, but please know that those directives are being given in that succinct way to protect you. And so will it be the friendliest reminder ever? Maybe not. But if it's an emergency situation, what, what we're looking for is making sure that everybody is safe. Um, and then understanding that security staff and really all staff are there to ensure your safety and are well-trained correctional professionals. I can't say this enough. There are reasons for the way that we do business. So that is if it's a five-minute movement that an offender has to go from school to their unit in that five minutes, that is not a good time for you to start a conversation with that inmate that you recognize from the last time that you saw them while you're under escort because really interfering with those procedures can diminish the whole system, right? So we're calling into credibility. We're calling to question the procedure, which works. We know it works. And if it doesn't work, we're going to look at it and do some process improvement. Um, 
So then we, if you if you have concerns, um, the staff directive should have been clear, but let's say they're not. And you can ask for clarification. Probably if it's an emergency situation, it's going to be pretty clear what people are going to ask you to do. And usually that looks something like get out of my way or get out of the way um, or please step to the side, step to the left, whatever that is. Pretty direct, um, assertive communication. If you're uncomfortable at any time or need assistance, please let a staff member know. And it doesn't matter if that's just your gut that's telling you this is an unsafe situation, I don't feel okay about this. It's better to make those decisions, take a minute, um, than not. And again, this is an environment that you perhaps are not incredibly comfortable with or that you come to the table with some biases that you might not even know you have. So there might be an underlying fear that you haven't addressed yet. So really acknowledging those feelings while you're in the prison. And I'll tell you, even being a staff member who's been in the prisons for over a decade, I, I still have moments where, why am I here? What am I doing here? This is a scary situation or at other facilities that are just different, learning about their culture or their physical plan means a lot to me going into them. Um, think about your concerns and fears ahead of time. Do some planning and some self-care around that. Discuss that with your facility liaison. So what are your specific concerns? Or contact your WIC staff contact and have those conversations about what was your experience when you went to the facility last time? What were you afraid of? How did you get over that? Or what was, was your concern legitimized at some point or not? Um, and then we want to talk about what not to do. So some of these things, we, the Department of Corrections certainly has a lot of volunteers, and so some of the challenging behaviors that I've listed here come from that group, that we've seen this want to protect a population that seems vulnerable, and but just really being aware of um, what you're doing when you're in a prison. So. We'd ask you not to change the rules because you don't like them. So if there is a change of rules that's going to happen because there's been some research about the best method to do something and not because you, in this moment, don't feel like that rule applies to you or applies to the offender that you're talking to, don't be afraid to address your own safety concerns. And so sometimes there's a certain level of embarrassment or I should know or I don't want to help myself as being scared right now, but being willing to say that. Paying really close attention to the nonverbal messages we send through dress code, um, both at women's and men's facilities. I think we have a propensity to kind of disregard the dress code when we're in a women's facility as women um, and as men, although I've not seen a man in a mini skirt yet come in to provide services at a women's prison, um, I have seen pretty poor uh, dress at the men's facilities. And so just really being aware of how much cleavage you have, that your pants are in good repair, that you don't have body parts hanging out. One, it establishes some level of pro professionalism, but two, can you move quickly in the, in the clothing that you have on? Do you have good shoes that are in good repair? Um, and not flip flops or some other thing that could get caught um, in a door or in a grate or, you know, um, not on vacation, I guess is the best way to say that. And then your own demeanor. Are you being too aloof? Are you not aware of your surroundings? Um, are you being kind to the people that you're around? And then their demeanor as well. So we would ask of Department of Corrections staff that they're always kind and hospitable to outside parties. And so asking the same of you. Um, don't forget where you are, being aware of your surroundings. So really, you're, you're in a prison. And so while I don't need you to be afraid the whole time, uh, just really being conscious of the environment that you're in. And then not arguing with staff or offenders, for that matter. There will be times that you are faced with confrontive behavior, confrontational behaviors. Um, for many staff and volunteers, they'll tell stories about their first time in a segregation unit or an intensive management unit where offenders are yelling pretty horrible things um, that meet sexual harassment criteria to you from tears. And 
just not giving, not showing any emotion around that and, you know, staying professional and not arguing with them about what they're saying or that they shouldn't. Uh, do that or that that's, it's just not the right time. So the, the behavior will be addressed. Um, it can be addressed in a really professional way and we'll talk more about that in compromise and manipulation. Uh, but arguing with staff or offenders in front of a bunch of people is just never a good strategy. So in preparing to go into a prison, we really want to focus on self-care, uh, be in a really good mind state. I would imagine for most of your job, you do that anyway, uh, but just really taking this up a level and thinking about, and I've asked you a couple of times today to think about your fears, but really do do that work and think about what I'm afraid of in this situation and then how do I prepare for it. Be really prepared for difficult behaviors. So whether this is somebody just walking by, making an inappropriate comment to you, or saying like, ooh, look, they're scared. Uh, what will you do? To, to What do you say back to that? Do you say anything back? Um, and then having the boundaries. So just really setting that you're there as a professional, this is your profession, and not there to make friends or to question the professionalism of other people or to change rules. Again, that's, again, certainly encouraging you to ask questions of staff. Verify information that you receive always. So if an offender is telling you something, verify that that's the truth, whether that's the movement schedule, whatever that is, verify um, some general information that you're receiving. And sometimes um, we assume something to be true. And so a, a really easy example is nobody has helped me. So you may hear, nobody has helped me with my reentry planning. I can't believe nobody will help me. And so starting with, well, is that their perception or is that the truth? And am I in my lane in dealing with this at all? So the next bullet is work within your scope. Is that your scope? Asking yourself often, like, I'm here to deal with this particular person about this very isolated incident or maybe series of incidents, but not their classification or their reentry plan or whatever else they're working on. Um, that is information you can certainly pass on to staff for them to investigate, but not something that you want to get into the habit of looking into things that are outside of your scope. So the other things to think about, what are your fears? What differences do you expect versus community advocacy? So what are those challenging behaviors? Because I know they exist in the community. And then what does this look like differently? So we talked earlier about just the impact of perhaps being in the same building as something, as, you know, the, the sexual violence occurred in this building and now I have to live here. And so if we think about the community, you know, if something happens in my house, I can maybe sell my house, or I can move, I can rent out my house, I can live somewhere else, I can live in a hotel. That is not an option in this situation. So based on my classification, I may have to live in that exact place. Um, so that in and of itself is one example of many uh, and something to think about. Um, and then what do you think you know about prison? And whether it's true or not, it's in the back of your mind. So really thinking about how you're going to work through that, how you then gather information when you are in prison that, like, wow, this is what it looks like. People are often surprised at the amount of art or sustainability projects that are occurring in Washington State prisons and not really what you expected based on your vision from Law and Order or whatever show you've seen um, about prisons. So then working in a custody situation, your guard should be up. And so that does have an impact. It's something that we really need to work through self-care on, that just the inability to leave at whatever time you want and the potential to have to stay, it has an impact. Being worried about people being behind you, about physical barriers all of the time is a big deal. It really changes the way that you see the world. And so acknowledging that, processing those feelings after you leave the prison, each and every time you come to a prison, is really important. We want to make sure you're acknowledging those feelings. We want to make sure that you stay healthy so that you can provide excellent services to the offenders that you're working with. And this really is a different kind of work within your scope 
And so just really being prepared for that world. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.